Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to the video. And be sure to hit the bell notification when you do so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video out, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. These days, I usually have several videos out a week. Hope you enjoy this. Hello, and welcome to Catholic Answers Live. Yeah, that music's a little different than we usually have. That's the weird questions music. That means we've got two hours of weird questions uh, with Jimmy Aiken. I love that music, uh, personally, uh, for a couple reasons. Partly, I just love the music. Secondly, I love doing weird questions with Jimmy Aiken. So both hours, we got a whole bunch of great weird questions coming up. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy that. Jimmy Aiken, of course, senior apologist here at Catholic Answers and the proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Hello, Jimmy Aiken. Hello, Cyril Kellett. And uh, thank you for being here for more weird questions. We always, this is always a fun one. Uh, yeah. Are, are they, are, you've looked ahead. Are they, are they quite weird? Mm -hmm. We have some good uh, weirdness. Most of them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, very good. Um, and uh, weird question. No, I, I see. This is where I always get Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world. Once I get one in my head, I mix them up. Jimmy Aiken's mysterious world uh, continues to be one of the most popular documentary podcasts uh, on the on the internets. Yeah, yeah, we're regularly in the top twenty on Apple uh, podcasts and in the U.S. And we've got over a hundred thousand listeners a week. We estimate not very nice, very nice. Drops each uh, Friday morning. You can get it by going to mysterious.fm, or you can just put in Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. And I've even tried by, it by misspelling Aiken, and I you you mm -hmm. get to it. It gets you there. Oh, good. Uh, all right, I won't be giving out the phone because the weird questions are in. They come to us. Uh, if you ever want to send us a weird question, you could just send it to radio at catholic.com or get in touch with Jimmy at one of his various ways people get in touch with him. And we'll, they'll, they'll find their way here. Uh, this one, Jimmy, comes from Eli. Hmm? Since God created time, space, and matter and is not bound by the three, when we die and are with him, are we no longer bound by the three? And in addition, would it be possible for us to be our own guardian angels? Not to say that we were created as angels before our earthly existence, but to say that we are able to traverse time back to our earthly beginnings and also assist in the guidance of those that we love. Okay, so when we talk about being with God, um, since God is not, as Eli says, bound by space— or matter or time, God does not have a body, and therefore we are not with God in a spatial sense. It's not like there's a place where God is located and we go to be with him in that place. Um, instead, we're with God in a spiritual sense uh, that is classically described in theology as having the beatific vision, where we have a an intuitive awareness of God's inner nature as a, as the source of all love and creation. And so we're not with him like I would be with you if I was in the studio in San Diego. Right. You know, we'd both be in the same place. So we don't leave um, we don't leave time for example, when we go to be, quote-unquote, with God. So how will we be bound or not bound by space, time, and matter when we're in the afterlife? Well, the afterlife has two phases. The first phase is what's known as the intermediate state, and it's the state between death and resurrection. Uh, the second phase is resurrection, where we're told in Scripture we'll live on the new earth. But in that disembodied state, well, we may not be bound by space. There is um, a significant strand in the history of Catholic thought that says spirits can manifest wherever they direct their attention, basically. And so, like with an angel, if an angel were performing a miracle in the studio in San Diego, you could say the angel is in the studio. It's not yeah. literally spatially there, mm -hmm. but that's where it's manifesting. And in a substantial current, not the only current, but in a substantial current of Christian thought, um, our, our spirits don't really have locations. They can manifest in different places like an angel can, but if that if that theory is correct, then they wouldn't be bound by space. On the other hand, there's another theory that says maybe we do have some kind of spiritual body that corresponds to our physical body, and that might be bound by space. We will, in the disembodied state, still be bound by time in some form, 
Um, it's actually a teaching of the church that all created beings are bound by time. God is the creator is not, but all created beings, including humans and angels, are. But they may experience time in different ways. Some of the ways they may experience it differently may be due to perception and how their minds work. Like, for example, you may notice that if you want to catch a fly, it's really hard to catch a fly because they are so fast. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you want to catch a sloth, it's really easy because they're so slow. And biologists have proposed that um, that different life forms perceive time at different rates. So flies perceive time really fast and sloths perceive it really slow compared to us, and we're kind of in the middle. Um, well, theologians have speculated something similar about angels, that angelic cognition may work differently than human cognition in terms of its perception of time. So uh, medieval theologians speculated about a, a condition that sort of that shares some elements of eternity or timelessness and some elements of time, and they called it eternity to distinguish it from eternity. And in eternity, you kind of basically, at least my understanding is, you basically don't really perceive the flow of time until something happens. So you're kind of just chilling until you get to a point where something changes. You don't oh. perceive time dragging on. So we might, in the disembodied state, have a sort of eternal perception. On the other hand, that's just speculation. We might perceive time exactly the way we perceive it now. Or it could be like our like how time seems to speed up and slow down in uh, in our own lives today. You know, you're at a really exciting event, you don't notice the passage of time because you're so focused on what's happening. Like if you're at a really great party or you're watching a really intense sports ball game or something like that, you don't really notice the passage of time. Whereas if what you're doing is completely uninteresting, time just seems to drag by. And so, yeah. you know, it might work like that. On the other hand, uh, you know, our imaginations are shaped by the one dimension of time that we experience here on Earth. But there could be more than one dimension of time. And so time might work in an even stranger way in the afterlife that we can't presently conceive. In a re-embodied state, we will, so after the resurrection in phase two of the afterlife, we may be bound by space because we'll have our bodies back and our bodies are spatial in nature. They take up space. But we may not be bound by it the way we are right now. There is a significant strand of, of speculation in the history of Christian thought that will basically have superpowers in the afterlife. Now, they didn't call them superpowers because that's a recent word that was invented in the 20th century, but that's basically what they are. And one of the superpowers that has been proposed for us to have is known as agility and agility is basically the is it's basically teleportation that you could instantly move between one place in the universe and another so if we have agility or teleportation then we wouldn't be bound by space in the way we are now but there still would be a spatial element to our experience when it comes to uh, could we be our own guardian angels, well, um, if certainly if time travel is possible, hypothetically, we could go back in time and perform guarding functions. Or even if time travel is not possible, we could pray to God for ourselves in the past and perform a kind of guarding function for ourselves. Uh, because, you, you know, no matter what your theory of time is, whether you believe all of time is real to God all at once, or even if you believe only an individual slice of time that we call the present is real, well, um, back when you needed help from God, God is God knows the future. So he knows you're going to be praying for yourself in the past. And so he can take into account the prayers that you say in the future back in the past when you needed the help. So it's hypothetically possible that we could function as guardians for ourselves, and we could call that function being a guardian angel, even though it's not an angel in the sense of normal angels. It's possible, but we don't. I'm not aware of any evidence we have for this being the case. 
All right. Thank you very much for that question, Eli. Thanks for getting us started with some very interesting stuff. There's lots more to come. It's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. We'll be right back with more of that right after this on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. Catholic Answers Live will return in a moment. Are you a coffee drinker? If so, you can now enjoy a coffee roasted to perfection by the Carmelite Monks of Wyoming. Delicious Mystic Monk coffee is roasted and prepared by monks in a hidden cloistered monastery and is available in over 25 varieties. All Mystic Monk coffees are works of perfection and labors of love. For more information on how to purchase Mystic Monk coffee, visit mysticmonkcoffee.com. That's mysticmonkcoffee.com. Underwriting for Catholic Answers Live is provided by Real Estate for Life. Real Estate for Life connects home buyers and sellers to real estate agents while supporting pro life organizations. On the web at realestateforlife.org. Are you ready to spread your wings? Wings is the weekly newsletter that's packed with exclusive news, program information, features, and updates of all that's going on at the Global Catholic Network. To sign up, go to EWTN.com, click subscribe, enter your name and email address, and you'll start getting your wings every week. Get your wings today. It's the weekly newsletter from EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. That's a little bit of weird music because it's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken this hour and next. Lots of weird uh, questions lined up. Uh, And uh, you can always send them to us if you've got them. Send them to radio at catholic.com. This one comes from Deacon Jason, uh, who says, When I was in fifth grade, I hit my head playing with some friends. I lost memories for the previous 48 hours and was officially diagnosed with amnesia. If I had committed a mortal sin during that period and forgot it, therefore never confessing it, what is my moral culpability? Well, we are still culpable for forgotten sins. So if, um, let's say you murder somebody, and then in the process of murdering them, they hit you on the head and you lose a memory of the fact that you murdered them, you still chose to murder them. Mm -hmm. And that still that still sticks on your soul until you repent. And if you genuinely turn back to God in repentance in a way that excludes all mortal sins, then you've just implicitly excluded that mortal sin you forgot about. You no longer will having murdered that person. If you even Mm -hmm. forgetting the, the murder. If you um, say, God, I'm, I'm really sorry for everything I've done against you, and I want to be with you, and I exclude mortal sin, I, I don't want it, I, I wish I'd never done it. Well, even if you don't, even though you don't remember committing the murder, you've just repented of the murder. You've done it implicitly rather than explicitly. And when you then go to confession, as long as you don't deliberately hold a sin back that you know about, you're going to be sacramentally absolved. So the next time you go to confession, you know, you're willing to reject all mortal sin, and the priest absolves you, and even though you don't remember the murder, you're going to be absolved of the murder. And that's one of the reasons that people often finish their confessions by saying things like, and for all my sins, I'm truly sorry, because we know that we don't always remember all of the sins we need to confess. And so people commonly put that in just to acknowledge that I may have forgotten something I need to confess, and I'm sorry for that, too. And so even, so the principle is you are responsible for sins you committed, whether you remember them or not. But when you repent and go to confession, they can still be forgiven. Okay, all right, uh, Deacon. I hope that that is uh, helpful. Uh, I, I, you can. I use... hope he didn't commit any murders in fifth grade. That's a little young. I know, I know. But if he did, what a terrible inconvenience to get amnesia right after that. Uh, I, I, you can, you can just get knocked in the head and lose the past forty-eight hours, huh? It... Yeah, it's possible. Wow. Traumatic brain injury is kind of like oh, that. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, but then if, if you're in a 1960s sitcom, of course, I think we've discussed this before. You Do get... <laughs> not hit the person a second time. That will only give them more traumatic brain injury. That was it the... is not a cure. <laughs> That's the saddest thing about 1960s TV. If you got amnesia, the cure 
was to whack you in the head again. All right, let's go for, uh, for a, a question from Nick. It's weird questions for Jimmy Aiken this hour. After taking your class in parapsychology, Nick says, I began to wonder, are there any similarities between how parapsychology field researchers investigate claims of apparitions and the ways in which the church investigates Marian apparitions? Also, because we believe Mary was assumed bodily into heaven, does that mean that she is then appearing Hearing bodily, okay. Now somebody move my <laughs> move my words. Oh, that the, she is then appearing bodily, or could the apparitions, like those of Saint Bernadette or the Fatima children, be, in a manner of speaking, kinds of miraculous OBEs? Okay, so what Nick is referring to is the fact that I, I've been asked uh, to teach parapsychology at the Rhine uh, Education Center, which is an outgrowth of the work of the most famous American parapsychologist of the 20th century, a guy named J.B. Ryan, And he founded an institute that still continues, and they teach parapsychology, and they've asked me to. So last fall, I taught an introduction to parapsychology class. Nick was one of the students. It went really well, and they've asked me to keep teaching that class. They've also asked me to teach um, this August a Christianity and parapsychology class and this fall a world religions and parapsychology class. So um, Nick or others might be interested in those. Well, it so happens that regarding Nick's first question, yeah, um, apparitional investigations are similar, that the church does, are similar to paranormal field investigations of apparitions, because oh. apparitions happen in, an apparition is where a a departed person appears. That's where the word apparition comes from. It's from appear. Okay. So if the Virgin Mary appears to you or St. Bernard appears to you, well, you got a big impressive visitor, but it's in principle the same as when the spirit of your deceased wife appears to you or when the former owner of your house appears to you in your house. Those are all apparitions. And so they get reported in both religious and non-religious contexts. And consequently, they get investigated in both not religious and non-religious contexts. In fact, there are other types of paranormal field investigations that, uh, that get performed, at, both in by parapsychologists and in the church. In fact, one of the things I'm going to be talking about in my Christianity and parapsychology course is how the church actually does three types of paranormal field investigations. One is on apparitions. Another is on miracles, you know, like when people get miraculously healed, and that gets investigated as part of the uh, canonization of saints. And the third is cases of spirit possession, because they're, before you do an exorcism on someone, you always want to verify they really are possessed, that this isn't mental illness or hoax or psychological you know, misunderstanding right. or something like that. And so the church actually is in the business of doing paranormal investigations, and they do have similarities, uh, a lot of similarities with how the church does it. Um, in parapsychology and in the church, one of the first things that happens when you're doing a field investigation is you look at possible natural causes like fraud, mental illness, or misunderstanding of natural phenomena. Like, for example, in the case of investigating a medical miracle, could the disease have just gone into spontaneous remission? Is mm -hmm. that a known phenomenon that happens with this disease? And so what happens both in the church and in parapsychology is you make a list of the possible explanations for the phenomena that's been reported or observed, and then you go down that list starting with the natural ones because natural explanations for events are more commonly correct than paranormal ones. And you look at the natural ones first and say, do these provide a good explanation for the facts in this case? If they do, well, you're kind of done. You know, if you find out, up oh, there's evidence of hoax here, well, then it's a hoax. Mm -hmm. Or you find out, up oh, this person's mentally ill and hallucinating, well, then that's the explanation. But if you can eliminate the natural ones, then that gives you reason to believe that something super, that something paranormal is happening, which may, in fact, be something supernatural. So, for example, in the case of investigating a medical miracle, 
phase one is they bring in doctors who are medical experts and they ask them about all the possible natural explanations for what happened with this person. And if the doctors conclude that there is no natural medical explanation for the event, then they turn it over to a team of theologians to look at it, to say, okay, let's look at this from a spiritual perspective now. Is there evidence that would indicate it was supernatural in origin? So there are a lot of similarities in the processes. Um, in terms of Nick's second question, would Mary's appearances like to the children at Fatima be OBEs? An out-of-body experience or uh, an OBE is what's known as an out-of-body experience. And basically what happens is in an OBE, your perspective shifts away from our body. Normally, we perceive the world from within our bodies. It's like I'm turning my head, I'm perceiving things from the perspective of my head and my eyes and my body more generally. But sometimes people's point of view shifts away from their body and they may even look back and see their body. This is commonly reported, for example, in near-death experiences where someone goes into cardiac arrest and their perspective shifts so that they're now like hovering up by the ceiling and looking down on their body and they see the doctors and the nurses working on them to try to restart their heart. And OBEs can happen in a variety of different ways. Uh, there are even techniques to deliberately induce them. There are people who've practiced how to do this. Um, would Mary's uh, experiences be considered OBEs since she has a body with her in heaven? Well, it would depend on whether, whether her perspective shifts away from her body or not. If she is still perceiving the world or the universe from within her body, then it wouldn't really be an out-of-body experience even though she's talking to the kids in Fatima. You can imagine how that might happen. For example, sometimes you'll watch science fiction, and it could be Star Wars, it could be Star Trek, but you'll see two people having a conversation by holograms. Oh, yeah, so, right. So right. one of them is standing in one place and talking to someone else, and then you see the hologram talking to that person. The apparitions could work like that. It could be Mary's up in heaven. She's perceiving the universe from the perspective within her own body, but um, she's being represented to the children at Fatima in a vision. So it's not, necess it's not necessary that her consciousness shift to a different perspective than her body. Mm -hmm. It could just be she's having the mystical equivalent of a, of a conversation through holograms. She's being represented by a vision mm -hmm. to the children, or she's being represented telepathically to the children, even though her own perspective is still within her body. On the other hand, it's possible that um, that she could be having an out-of-body experience, that her perspective, sh her perspective shifted down to Fatima, Portugal, to talk to the kids. And because we're likely to have vastly greater abilities in the afterlife than we do now, especially if you're the Virgin Mary, she could be multitasking. She could have her perspective in her body and have multiple other perspectives she's moderating at the same time. So it might be a sort of partial out-of-body experience for her. Another um, phenomenon that's related to this, is, for the kids, of course, it's just an apparition. They're not out of their bodies. But it's possible right. the Virgin Mary is having an OBE. And another phenomenon that this could be linked to is what's known as bilocation. Bilocation is where a person appears in more than one place at a time, and this is studied both in parapsychology and in religion, like with Padre Pio, who was famous for appearing both in Rome and in his monastery at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when that would happen, he would kind of like go quiet in his monastery and people would perceive him as if he was in Rome. So it's like kind of a telepathic projection or vision of him that's happening in Rome. He's not physically there, um, but it, he appears to be there to people. And that could also be what's happening with things like the Virgin Mary appearing to the Fatima children. It could be a form of bilocation. 
Ah, fascinating. Oh, so uh, the, the, uh, that by location, people sometimes think that his physical body is in two places. Yeah, and, and, and most theologians say that's not accurate. Um, now, I think there are there are some ways you could you could maybe make that happen using relying on quantum mechanical properties of matter, but historically they didn't know about quantum mechanics, and so theologians like Aquinas would say his body's not really moving; yeah. it's some kind of appearance, and it might even be a tactile appearance where you could touch him. Mm -hmm. But they say, nah, his body is really in his monastery. Nick, uh, thank you for all the interesting questions. Appreciate that. It's weird questions for Jimmy Aiken this hour, and I've got a whole bunch more to come. And while we're, we're heading into the break right now, I'll invite you to take a look at uh, CatholicAnswersConference.com. Find out about our big September conference uh, coming up. And it's all about Jesus. It's all about the parables and sayings of Jesus. Lots of wonderful speakers there. Among them, Jimmy Aiken, our guest today. We hope to see you there. Check it out at CatholicAnswersConference.com. Right back with more weird questions for Jimmy Aiken on Catholic Answers Live. When the resurrected Jesus appeared to disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize him until the breaking of the bread. The same is true today. In the Holy Eucharist, we really meet Jesus. In The Eucharist is Really Jesus, author Joe Heschmeyer explains how knowing Jesus in the Eucharist is the key to understanding all of Christian faith. Order your copy of The Eucharist is Really Jesus today at shop.catholic.com or get it at a good Catholic bookstore. Our Lord needs articulate defenders of the truth to spread the joy of the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Monthly Giving Club, Society 315, helps you fulfill the call in 1 Peter 315 to always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you. For as little as $10 a month, you'll help Catholics grow in faith, bring lapsed Catholics home, and lead non-Catholics to the truth. Go to casociety315.com and join today. Is relativism dead? It sure seems dead. Each day, new moral demands are made and they are presented to us as absolutes. Everything from transgender ideology to physician-assisted suicide is presented as a moral good that all right-thinking people must accept. But Catholic Answers' own Carlo Broussard says look deeper and you will see today's moralism is just relativism dressed up in new clothes. Carlo's eye-opening book, the new relativism shines a light on how the sacred moral teachings of this age cover up a deep denial of moral truth. Order your copy of The New Relativism today at shop.catholic.com and be prepared to defend the truth against aggressive relativism. The New Relativism at shop.catholic.com or ask for it at a good Catholic bookstore near you. Welcome back. Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy Aiken is our guest. And it's a weird questions episode. Uh, something we started a few years ago and it has been very popular. And you can see why. It's fun getting uh, these uh, bit offbeat questions uh, for Jimmy. And this one comes from a familiar name, Jimmy. Simca Fisher uh, mm -hmm. asked you a yeah. question. Well-known blogger. And uh, said, <laughs> and I have to say, I really like the question. What are the spiritual ramifications of fungus? Well, in terms of spiritual ramifications, you could take that one of two ways. You could take that in terms of what effect does, do, does fungus have on human beings, and thus how might it impact them spiritually. Or you could take it in terms of what does it reveal spiritually? What spiritual lessons does fungus have to teach us? And a lot of people today might be you know, kind of dismissive of this question. They don't think about fungus a lot, and they might say, well, it really doesn't have any spiritual lessons to teach us. Um, you know, one might even, some people, I don't know about Simca, but some people might even be inclined to ask this question as a joke. But that oh. doesn't mean it doesn't get a serious answer or right. one that has spiritual content, because the truth is all creatures reflect aspects of their creator 
everything that God made in the world displays his glory and says something about him. And in the history of Christianity, um, Christians were very interested in this question, uh, going all the way back to the early centuries. Like there was a second, third century document known as the Physiologus, which was kind of like a nature handbook that looked at things like animals and plants and allegorized them and said, here are the lessons we can learn from this animal. You know, you think about, for example, a lion. Well, the lion is used in the Bible as a symbol of God, you know, mm -hmm. so how, what can we learn about lions that would tell us something about God? Well, they're strong, they're noble, they're, you know, they, they, they have a variety of different attributes principally strength and, and nobility that one could compare to God. And if you think about other animals and plants, you can find similar things. And so there are lots and lots of uh, works down through the history of Christianity. And this didn't really change until the 1600s or 1700s with the scientific revolution. But if you, if you read old bestiaries, which are like books about animals or old, um, uh, books about plants, you know, herbs and stuff, they will draw spiritual lessons from them, from what they're talking about. They'll say, like, this plant, for example, that grows along paths is a symbol to remind us of the pilgrimage and journey we have in this life. And so you will get spiritual you know, allegorizations yeah. of, of created beings. And that's going to include fungus. Uh, because, you know, like mushrooms, now they didn't have the distinction that we do between plants and fungus. You know, that's a, that's, that wasn't on their conceptual map. And so if you look in like a book of about herbs or plants, you're going to find discussions of mushrooms and they're a kind of fungus. So I did that. I looked huh? up in, in <laughs> Hildegard of Bingen. She's a doctor of the church. Okay. Um, she wrote a book called Physica in which she looks at different plants and animals, and she's looking at them primarily from a medical perspective, which gets us more to the what effect can they have on humans mm -hmm. side of the question. Um, she doesn't have... A, she doesn't have she's got a big discussion of mushrooms because there's bunches of different types of mushrooms um and she doesn't really go for the god angle so much but she does go for the human angle and it, for example in her treatment of mushrooms this is physica 172 she says the mushroom that grows on an almond tree so specific type of mushroom it grows on an almond tree is not rightly hot or cold and hot heat and temperature were a big deal in her um, in her medical system she talk about mm -hmm. this kind of substance is more hot this kind of substance is more cold and this is how you use it to treat stuff so she says it's not rightly hot or cold but has a topor in it uh, it is not valuable for eating because it stirs up but if worms are nascent on a person, so like they've got a parasitical infection of worms, um, before they are alive, so before they hatch, take the mushroom which grows on the almond tree when it is fresh and recently taken from the tree. Hold it over boiling water so that it becomes warm and moist. Place it frequently, warm and moist, over the swelling where the worms are developing and the swelling will vanish. If the worms have hmm. grown so that they are alive, dry the same mushroom in an oven which is warm but without coals, reduce it to a powder, and frequently place it over the sore, and the worms will die. So here's a way, according to St. Hildegard of Bingen, doctor of the church, that based on the medical science of her day, you could use um, fungus, in this case, a mushroom that grows on an almond tree to treat parasitical infections and thus it could have a benefit to humans and that has spiritual ramifications but if you want to um, have the more allegorized version of here's what these mushrooms can teach us about god you'd need to check other uh, medieval works of this nature because hildegard is more focused on the medical aspects and she doesn't go into the more um, allegorical uh, aspects in physica. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Simcup, for that uh, excellent uh, question. Uh, I wonder how, how much, maybe you know this, I don't know, Jimmy, but these uh, these remedies, for example, that's a, it's a very specific remedy. It must have been tried. Do people go back and read these books and, and uh, say, well, what are, what's the chemical mm -hmm. properties we might get? Yeah. So it's essentially a form of folk medicine uh, because it's pre, pre before the scientific revolution. And people do go back and look at folk remedies and say, maybe there's something here that we can learn from. Uh -huh. um, you know, a lot of the remedies don't really work. Like one of the things phys uh, that um, that Hild Hildegard talks about in Physica is em she talks a lot about jewels and stones and how you can use them to treat illnesses. And she thinks, for example, that you can use um, emeralds to treat epilepsy. Oh. Well, that's not really supported by, like, you put an emerald under, under your tongue and your seizure is going to get better. Oh. Um, and so she, you know, a lot of her ideas were reasonable for the time, but they haven't been borne out by subsequent research. But modern medical researchers do look at older folk remedies and uh, with an eye towards maybe there's something we can learn here. Maybe some of these worked. For example, that's how we got aspirin. Aspirin is uh, acetylsalicylic acid is um, basically it's a near chemical um, clone of salicylic acid, which is found in willow bark and willow bark historically was used to treat headaches and fevers. And so we then came up with this kind of synthetic willow bark substance based on folk medicine that oh, we yeah. now know and use as aspirin. Oh, very cool. Uh, well, uh, Simka, thank you again for the question. This one comes from Stephen. It's weird questions today with Jimmy Aiken, and this one comes from Stephen. Suppose we were all in the matrix, and all our history is the result of a computer programmer's choice. The arguments for the existence of God may still work. Yeah, but, they would, because well, you still need who built the computer programmer, so there's got to be a God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but would this undercut the plausibility of the Christian faith, since its veracity is based on certain historical events actually having happened? So we need here to distinguish between two different understandings of what might be what might be meant by being in the Matrix. If you watch the first Matrix movie, um, people are alive and, and they're kept alive in tanks. And then the world they experience is a computer simulation that's fed into their brains. Um, so that's what actually happens in the movie, The Matrix. But um, when you have a lot of people discussing this question, what they're really asking about is what's known as the simulation hypothesis, where everything in the universe is part of a computer simulation. And so our bodies are part of that simulation. It's not like there's a tank somewhere that has the body of Cy Kellett floating in it. Cy Kellett and his body would be part of the simulation. Okay. And, and since that's what most people are asking about when they pose this kind of question, um, that's what I'll assume for purposes of this answer. And the answer is it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't necessarily pose a challenge to the Christian faith. Um, it, because all we're really altering here is the substrate that our, that the universe is made of. Um, for ages and ages and ages, people didn't know what the universe was made of. You had all these speculations by um, the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers, for example, about what is the fundamental stuff that the universe is made of. Um, you know, one theory was, well, it's all actually fire just taking different forms, or it's all actually water taking different forms, you know, because you can see how water can be solid, liquid, or gas, and so mm -hmm. maybe everything is water just taking different forms. Or um, maybe it's flux, you know, taking different forms. And one of the theories that eventually developed was the four classical elements, air, earth, fire, water, and sometimes ether. Um, and so for a long, long time, people really didn't know what the universe is made out of the modern atomic theory which is actually not the same as the classical atomic theory wasn't really proved till 1905 
Albert Einstein gave us that mm -hmm. prior to 1905. So like in the late 1800s, a lot of people, yeah, atoms kind of make the math work, but maybe they're just a mathematical trick and it's not really atoms. It was Einstein who proved atoms. Um, so that's our current understanding. But the Christian faith doesn't require atoms. It doesn't require the particles atoms are made of. It doesn't require protons and electrons or quarks or anything like that. And so consequently, the Christian faith could be true if, instead of being made of atoms, the world was made of data patterns. And so God the Son could take on human form in the matrix and redeem us in the matrix. It's just that his body would be made out of data patterns instead of matter. And that's okay, because we historically have not known what the universe is made of, and the Christian faith does not depend on knowing what the universe is made of. So as long as we have souls that are attached to our data pattern, to our bodies, it doesn't matter whether they're made of data patterns or subatomic particles or, or the four classical elements or anything else. The Christian faith doesn't care what the universe is made of. What it cares about is that God made it and that we're in it, we have souls, and that God the Son became incarnate in it and redeemed us. So consequently, um, even if it turned out that we are in a simulated universe and there's some other universe running the simulation, you know, we're in computers that are part of an, another universe, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily disprove the Christian faith. It, it, it might or might not be consistent with the Christian faith, but um, it wouldn't automatically disprove it. And so if you'd like more information about this, go all the way back to the beginning of Mysterious World and listen to episode 17, where oh. I talk about this. Uh, you can get to it by going to mysterious.fm slash 17. Stephen, thank you for that question. It's Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken, and we'll take a quick break and be right back to that after this on Catholic Answers Live. Hang on. We'll be right back with more Catholic Answers Live. The Catechism defines evangelization as the proclamation of Christ and His Gospel by word and the testimony of life. But what does that look like in real life? It looks like St. Paul Street Evangelists out in the public square sharing the good news. We're a Catholic nonprofit that starts conversations by handing out free sacramentals. Then we employ our method of listen, befriend, proclaim, and invite. Catholic Answers is supported in part by St. Paul Street Evangelization. Visit streetevangelization.com to learn more. Want the latest pro-life news? Want it delivered? Sign up. It's free. EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your source for everything happening now in the fight to protect the sanctity of human life. New episodes delivered every week to your inbox. So if you really want to know, sign up today. Go to EWTN.com forward slash pro-life today. Welcome back, Catholic Answers Live. I really like the questions today. We got a lot of really good, weird questions today. Uh, so uh, if you've got a weird question, if one occurs to you, you send it to us at radio at catholic.com. And every now and then we get to do these shows with Jimmy with the weird music and the weird questions. And here's another one. This one's from Timothy. St. Guinefort was the dog saint who, according to legend, saved a baby but was falsely accused of trying to attack it and subsequent i guess was subsequently killed mm -hmm. his small cult was quashed by the church but if we are to believe in an animal afterlife does that mean that animals could technically become saints and could we pray to them okay so uh, first we should explain who saint guinefort was uh saint guinefort was a greyhound so a specific breed of dog um, in France in the 1200s, at least this is the story. And uh, St. Guinefort's owner uh, had a baby son, and one day the owner was out of the house doing stuff. And when he comes back to the house, uh, Guinefort, like a good dog, rushes up to him to greet him, but he notices that Guinefort has blood on his mouth. 
His mouth is bloody. And he goes in to the nursery and sees like the cot that hit the, the bassinet or whatever that the baby was in is like overturned. There's no sign of the baby. There's blood all over the place. And he thinks Gwynefort has killed and probably eaten my son. And so he is enraged and he takes his sword, this is being the 1200s, and, um, and kills Gwynefort. But then he hears his son cry out and he lifts up the baby bed and his son is under the baby bed with the corpse of a snake that has been repeatedly bitten to death. And so he, fi- he realizes what happened is that the snake attacked his son and Gwynefort defended his son and bit the snake to death. And that's where all the blood came from. And so he then regrets having killed Gwynefort. And they take Gwynefort and bury him in a well uh, in some versions of the story. Um, and it becomes a kind of shrine. And actually, now, Timothy said his his small cult, meaning group of people who were devoted to him as a saint, I don't know how small it was, because um, pilgrimages to St. Gwynefort's burial site were still being done as late as 1940. Holy smokes. So that's like a 700-year run. And people would go to St. Gwynefort's uh, site since he had protected this child. And since he had been killed innocently, Gwynefort was kind of regarded as a martyr dog. And, um, and, uh, and since he had protected this child, people would go to him and pray for children. Like, if you have a sick child, you might go to St. Gwynefort's shrine and, and ask St. Gwynefort to intercede for the cure of your child. And that happened as late as the 1940s. So even though this was not an approved you know, sainthood, it was, it was a 700-year-long cult, and it may still exist. Um, in any and cult is not being used in the bad sense here. It just means a group that has a particular devotion. So let's. Um, so that's who Saint Gwynefort is. By the way, there are other similar tales. Now, even though this is, we do have fairly early records about Saint Gwynefort that do date from the 1200s. I have a little question about the historicity of this because we also have similar stories. Um, from other areas besides France. Like in Wales, there was a similar dog named Gellert, and the same exact thing happened. You know, the the dog greets the master, the master sees the dog is bloody, assumes it's killed his son, and he kills Gellert. So I'm not sure what the actual historical basis of any of these is. But those are the stories. Now, if... uh, If animals have an afterlife, and that is not the common opinion, the common opinion has always been that animals don't have an afterlife, Um, but that's not church teaching. That's uh, it's it it's a theological opinion, and in studying the matter, I did an episode of Mysterious World on this. Um, it turns out that when you look at the arguments for animals not having an afterlife, they're philosophical in nature. Like when you look at Thomas Aquinas's discussion of this, he's making philosophical arguments, not even biblical arguments, but just philosophical arguments. And I concluded that his arguments aren't very persuasive. Um, and since it's not church teaching, it's just a matter of opinion, I think we need to be more open on this. And in fact, there's some evidence, which you can go to the Animal Afterlife episode of Mysterious World if you want more information about. There's actually some evidence that at least some animals may have an afterlife. So let's assume that's true for purposes of answering Tim's question. I'm not saying it's true, but let's assume it's true for purposes of discussion. If animals have an afterlife, does that mean they can be saints? Well, maybe, but maybe not. One of the things that um, that has, that Catholic thought has historically distinguished between is the state of heaven that we will receive, which involves sp- full spiritual union with God, where we have the beatific vision and so forth, and other states that could happen to us in the afterlife. And the um, the persistent opinion is that heaven is a gift. It is something we do not deserve. 
And so God didn't didn't have to give us the option of heaven. He chose to do that, but he didn't have to choose to do that. He could have given us an afterlife where we're in a state of pure nature, where we are happy and we continue to exist for the rest of eternity and we're, we're happy and it's all great. We just don't have that spiritual union with God. So you could propose, well, uh, maybe that's what happens with good dogs. Maybe they, they go to a, a, a realm of the afterlife where they're happy for eternity, but since they didn't really have a conscious awareness of God in this life, they might not have a conscious awareness of God in the afterlife. And so they might have a perfectly happy afterlife that just doesn't include the beatific vision. So they wouldn't be saints in that sense of having the kind of communion with God that human saints and angelic saints have. Um, on the other hand, God could give them the same gift he gave us. He could elevate their intellects to the point that they can perceive him and understand him, just like he's going to elevate our intellects in the afterlife. And if that's the case, then dogs could be holy and in union in a way that uh, that they have a conscious awareness of God and the ability to communicate on a greater level than they do. And if and we're out in fringe territory now, but if that were the case, you could pray to them be in principle because um, we can make requests of dogs now. You know, I, I, if, if I'm with my sister's dog and I say, come, Luna, well, that's a request and an instruction, and she knows what to do. She knows to come over to me. Um, so we can make requests of dogs now, and sometimes they are requests because sometimes the dog doesn't want to do it. Um, but, uh, but if that's the case, and if dogs are with God in the afterlife and able to communicate, having elevated intellects, then you could make requests of them there in principle. But here comes the other side of the equation. The church doesn't have good evidence for dogs or other animals being in heaven, and therefore it doesn't canonize them. And we're not allowed to offer public prayer, meaning like prayer in a church under church auspices, like when you're saying a litany of the saints or something. Churches are not allowed to offer public prayer to saints that have not been canonized. You need to either be beatified or canonized and listed in what's known as the Roman Martyrology if public devotion and prayer is going to be shown to someone in a church. However, privately you can pray to anyone you want. So um, I couldn't rule it out. Let's say you had a really good dog who has gone on to be with God. If you wanted to say, hey, you know, uh, Rover, if you're up there, could you ask God to bless me? Well, what I can tell you is church law wouldn't prohibit that, but it's not a common practice. All right. Well, thank you, Timothy, uh, for the question. At least and, if it is a common practice, people don't talk about it. Uh, man, that Gwynefort story, though. That's a that's a tearjerker. Gwynefort? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just terrible. That's like always, the worst O. Henry always, story ever. I know. Always <laughs> check out the circumstances before you kill your dog. I know. <laughs> at least look around for the baby but uh you know you got the sword there the dog acted up apparently poor Gwynefort though good dog Gwynefort and Gellert and all, and all and all you medieval dogs who are saving babies from snakes and getting nothing but grief for it uh we're gonna take a very quick uh break and then we'll be back we've got lots of great uh questions coming up uh for Jimmy Aiken it is weird questions for Jimmy Aiken and they all get sent in so we got a whole hour more of uh Jimmy or weird questions for Jimmy to answer if you like weird questions with Jimmy answer uh, with Jimmy Aiken you will love Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. If you haven't checked it out, check it out at mysterious.fm or just type into your machine, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. I want to invite you again to please join us for the Catholic Answers Conference. Check it out at catholicanswersconference.com. How would you like to go to a conference where Dr. S uh, Scott and Kimberly Hahn will be speakers, Dr. Ray Grandi will be a speaker, and Jimmy Aiken will be a speaker? I mean, right there. I'd go to that conference, uh, but there's more. Father Sebastian Walls will be there. You have to go to the conference. You're emceeing it. 
I know. I, I it's a combination of have to and oh, get to. Oh, I get it. I, 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 I see. You were saying, well, you, w- you would even if you didn't have to. <laughs> that is exactly what I was saying. Okay. I need a few minutes to pull myself together uh, and, uh, after that Gwynefort story. So I'm really glad that a break has come up. Uh, we'll be right back with more uh, weird questions for Jimmy. Ake. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm told use the promo code early and you get $50 off your conference ticket. I guess I should have said that. Use the promo code early. E-A-R-L-Y is the promo code. Don't yep. just use it now. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Don't be early in using the promo code. Use the actual word, E-A-R-L-Y, uh, and you will save at catholicanswersconference.com. Uh, right back with more Jimmy Aiken and hopefully no more stories about dogs getting stabbed. Right after this on Catholic Answers Live. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially subscribing to this channel. I'm trying to grow it, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless.